Hello today. We're going to get started here in, in uh, just a minute. Uh, hi, I'm Tom Webster. I'm a partner with Sounds Profitable. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to the Sound Summit. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. This is the first Sound Summit. It's the first uh, full day, all podcasting all the time. So I hope you like podcasting because you're going to get a lot of it uh, here today. Uh, so thanks very much for coming here. Uh, again, I'm with Sounds Profitable. We could not have done this without the help of Ad Results Media, Magellan AI, The Roost, ESPN, Good Karma Brand. So please give them a hand as well for helping us uh, bring this full day together. So uh, we have four sessions today. Each session is going to start with a, a, a short talk and then a panel. We've got a, a, an exciting panel coming up about true crime, actually a fireside chat that is going to happen here um, about true crime. I, I think FDR invented the fireside chat. So hopefully by the end of this panel, we'll know who murdered FDR. That's my goal. Before we start uh, with the panel though, since you're all here to, in Austin, welcome to Austin as well, to officially welcome you to Austin, a, an adopted son of Austin, a man who lives here, who loves it, AJ Feliciano from The Roost is here today, and he's gonna tell you all about why podcasting and why Austin and why all of this matters. So give it up for AJ. There you go. Hi, everybody. I know some of you in the room here. Welcome to South by Southwest. Welcome to Austin. The city is amazing. If you haven't been here before, there's so much to do, so much nightlife, so many things to do outdoors. Austin is my home. Austin is where my heart is. And so I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about, you know, generally, why are we talking about podcasting at South by Southwest? And how does that relate back to the city of Austin? And so before I dig into all this, first, if you're new to podcasting, I'm sure you've seen data slides. I'm sure you've Googled the heck out of it. So we're gonna go through about 80 data slides that basically talks through all things in podcasting. I'll leave that to Tom later. But if there are some key takeaways when it comes to podcasting and why we should be talking about it on the world stage is these three things. Why should it matter to South by Southwest? Why should we be talking about it on a much larger scale? 120 million US monthly podcast listeners right, in a population of about 325 million. 38% of the population is listening to podcasts. It matters. 50% of millennials, right, where the bulk of the spending power actually is, listen to these things on a weekly basis. And with consumer behavior changing all across media, that matters. We should be talking about it here. 4.3 billion in advertising revenue projected for this year and climbing, especially with what's going on in TV and streaming and all these other mediums, People are looking at podcasting and saying, this is a place where I'm getting gonna get more bang for my buck. We should be talking about podcasting at South by Southwest. But before we talk about that, let's, let's also talk about just the general nature of South by Southwest. This festival started in 1987. It was a music festival. It still is a music festival in its you know, second weekend and you'll see some of it this weekend as well. Austin is all about music, right? But in 1994, it transformed. It started to bring in things like interactive and film and other things in the media space. And then tech started to infiltrate it. Then into the 2000s, because it was already in music and media and TV and film and all these different things, tech, education, government came into the mix. It dawned on me, why did South by Southwest feel the need to evolve over time and bring all these things together? And they actually say it on the website, South by Southwest celebrates the convergence of tech, film, music, education, and culture, and so much more. South by Southwest evolved because of where they were situated. Austin was changing decade after decade. And with that comes a convergence of different ideas. And it dawned on me, Austin's a pretty special place. This is one of those places where industries collide in a very, very unique way. And we get to share in ideas, collaborate in those ideas, and those ideas eventually become podcasts. Isn't that where generally the best ideas come from, right? Direct to consumer, low barrier to entry, a way to get your message out to the crowd. And Austin is unique in that it has all these different industries, but the ones I've started here are particularly interesting in Austin, technology. Right? Dell started here from a UT Austin college dorm room. We've got Oracle, we've got IBM, 
we've got you know Meta, we've got at the HQ2 for Apple, and the list goes on and on. Obviously, SpaceX and Tesla, but we don't talk about him. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, and then education. We have University of Texas at Austin, right? One of the most revered public institutions in the country with a lot of influence, with a lot of reach. But one of the most important factors is government. Did you know that, well, Austin is now a top 10 city in the country. The Austin Metro is closing in on 3 million, making it also a top 10 metro in the entire country. And the fastest growing metro in the entire, the corridor between San Antonio and Austin, which I'm gonna dub ASA right now, or ASA, I'm kidding, um, is the fastest growing corridor in the entire country. People are moving here in droves. But the government sector is particularly interesting because of those top 10 cities, Austin and Phoenix are the only ones that are the capitals of their states. So when we're talking about, oh, this sort of boom in Austin is a fad, or like it all just happened during the pandemic, it's been happening since the 60s. Austin has been growing at a rapid rate, and it's not gonna stop because all these industries are colliding right here in the city. So why does this matter back to podcasting? Well, a lot of people have taken notice. A lot of people have set up shop here. A lot of people have moved here. And when you start asking them, why did you move to Austin? They'll give you a number of different reasons. Tax breaks is definitely not one of them. Um, obviously, there's no uh, quality of living. You could get a number of different reasons. But what I find the most is that some people will say, Austin, there's an opportunity in Austin. And so when you start to dissect that, it sort of all boils back to, it provides the rich diversity where ideas actually come from for them to one, operate their business and, and send out their message with all the various resources that Austin actually provides. So you kind of see that evidence in like what, the biggest podcast in the country, Joe Rogan, right? What does that show about? It's not necessarily about Joe, it's about the idea of questioning everything. And he brings on folks from a diversity of, uh, of different industries. We're talking about celebrities, politicians, even beekeepers, right? I was, that episode was fantastic. You gotta check out the beekeeper one. She was awesome. But the idea here is that he is basically, you know, exposing us to worlds that the mainstream should care about. And he chose Austin as that sort of central point in the country to bring everything together. And that influence naturally occurs because we have so much to offer in that regard. Now, same goes for many of these other studios here. So when it comes to, what is the message that I'm trying to get across here is that Austin has a special sauce. And while we're looking around and figuring out like what is the next growth area? Where should I be setting up shop? Where should I be investing resources? Where should I be finding talent? Where should I be just spending time? I am gonna stand here and stand for Austin all day, every day, okay? But it's less about Austin and more about pulling back the camera. It's about confluence, it's about immersion. It's about stepping outside of our comfort zones. It's about mingling with other industries. It's about spreading new ideas and just, you know, just being part of much, something much larger. It could be sort of a PTA meeting, right? It could be affinity groups. It's putting yourself in, in, in situations and in groups where you, they challenge convention, where they challenge your way of thinking and they provide new perspectives that will ultimately find this our next podcast hit, right? Let's break out of our circles a little bit. Find a community that has that rich diversity of thought. And that's where I think the next podcast is, is gonna come from. So I'll leave you with a little bit of a quote here. Uh, Nicholas Negroponte is a famous MIT professor. He was actually one of the first TED speakers ever. So I thought that was appropriate. Um, innovation is fostered by information gathered from new connections, from insights gained by journeys into the disciplines or places, from active and collegial networks and fluid open boundaries. And what he's basically saying there is open your, open the scope, right? Let others in. Find areas that sort of challenge the way that we think so that we gain new ideas and use podcasting as a medium to get them out there and flourish. And so with that, thank you so much for your time. My name is AJ Feliciano from The Roost. I hope you have a wonderful day. Enjoy South Five. All right, who's ready for murder? Who is ready for straight up murder? Uh, I am super excited about this next uh, fireside chat that we're about to have. You're, you're gonna see uh, John and Nick from the Mr. Ballin podcast. 
uh, Brittany from Audio Chuck and Kylie, who's the host of Dark Down East, which is the Down East in that is for Down East, Maine, which is where I'm from. Um, I did not get murdered, by the way, but I am really thrilled to learn about how to do it properly in Down East, Maine. And I've been learning that from from her podcast. So without any further ado, uh, let's bring on some murder. Let's bring up John, Nick, Brittany and Kylie for a fireside chat about the business of true crime. I've been told I need to vamp for one minute, so back to Jake Gyllenhaal for a moment. Uh, this, by the way, is a huge swing for us. Uh, we're really, really happy that you're here. Our goal is for this to happen every year without us, for it just to be the center of podcasting at South by Southwest, because darn it, we're big enough, we're good enough, and people like us, I think, right? You're going to see some stats a little bit later on about how big the space has gotten. There's more than 100 million people, uh, as AJ mentioned, listen to podcasts. And you're going to hear about how lucrative it is to be in podcasting. And now I think we're going to hear how to get murdered in podcasting. So let's give it up for the panel. A quick disclaimer about the audio in this section. Due to a scheduling conflict, one of the panelists wasn't fully mic'd before the panel had to start. As a result, we've adjusted the audio elsewhere to make up for this. Give you a list of interesting questions to ask. So, let's start, we'll start at the end. Oh boy. All right, you go first, Brittany. Assuming intro myself? Okay, this one I picked up specifically oh. for you. Oh, great, okay. What initially drew you to the true crime genre, and how did you get started creating true crime podcasts? Mm. So, true crime. I remember growing up in, like many of us, my mom watching whatever major trial was happening that was televised at the time. I'm from South Florida, so there were some iconic ones that were happening for quite a while there. Um, at eight years old, my version of television was Law & Order SVU. And then I actually went totally bizarre direction. I was in, I went to college for dance, so I went full musical theater, Broadway world. And after a while, um, wanted more. Wanted to be able to tell stories that I felt like could make a real difference and went to what I knew best, which was what I was consuming, and fell into podcasting, as I like to say, as many of us, ass backwards. Um, and if I was gonna do it with anyone, I wanted to do it with Audio Check. So I went from glitz and glam stage to like much more boots on the ground, gritty, true crime. Very cool, very cool. What about you? Well, it's funny that you mentioned your mom watching the trials at the time. Yeah. My mom was like a dateline, 48 hours. But I would wake up to get a glass of water as a kid and like run as fast as I could through the living room because I didn't want to see anything on the screen. It freaked me out. My way into true crime was actually from my education. I went to school for journalism, investigative journalism. And then I graduated and I didn't touch my degree. I went more so into marketing, had a career in radio. I went on tour with One Direction and then I came back and I uh, was living in New York City also doing radio but uh, began producing a show, a podcast, a business show. And during that time, spending a lot of time on the subway in the city, I was listening to the popular podcast at the time, of course, Crime Junkie, Top of the Charts, um, was getting into Serial. And, you know, I kept saying to myself, why doesn't anyone do a true crime show that's focused entirely on New England. I'm from Maine, I'm very proud of my home state, my home region, and I would tell anyone who would listen, someone should start a show just covering New England cases. And everyone <laughs> was looking at me like, yeah, you, you should do it. <laughs> and uh, you know, it took the pandemic sending me home from New York City unexpectedly back to my home state and wanting to revisit that hard-earned education, expensive mm. education, that expensive <laughs> degree hanging on the wall, when I finally said, oh yeah, I should be the one to start a New England true crime podcast. So I leveraged that investigative journalism background, my experience in podcasting, having produced a show for about five years, and I launched in late 2020 and haven't looked back. I was an independent creator for so long and then joined Audio Check at the start of this year. <laughs> and, you know, same as, as Brittany, there's no network I wanted to join other than Audio Check. You know, when I started from the beginning, I had this tiny little whisper of a dream. Wouldn't it be cool if someday Ashley Flowers heard my show? Hmm. And now Ashley Flowers is a colleague and a mentor and a friend. So it's, it's been a very 
fun ride. A lot of work has gone behind it, but I think, yeah, that's, that was my path to true crime. Very cool. Thank you, Kathy. We have another New England guy in the corner here. <laughs> so, Johnny, it's the same question for you. Yeah. Hello, I'm John, the New England guy. Uh, <laughs> I'm better known as Mr. Ballin online. Uh, and I host the Mr. Ballin podcast as well as the uh, Mr. Ballin Medical Mysteries podcast. Um, and I have a YouTube channel as well. Um, and, and, you know, honestly, to, to get to podcasting, I don't even know how I got here. Because <laughs> I started in the military uh, and I got out of the military in 2017 and I was struggling to find a job. Um, and in an effort, to get a civilian job, I wound up putting together this like networking event, I guess, if you will. It's like a charity that basically brought together veterans and employers to help them get jobs. Uh, and so I kind of inadvertently created a job helping other veterans get jobs. But critically, uh, it was a nonprofit, and so we needed to raise money for it. And we began using storytelling on LinkedIn primarily to talk about you know, different veterans and their skill sets and how they apply to the civilian world. Um, and we were really good at, at telling these stories on, online, and I, I began to see the, the power of, of the internet. You know, uh, I, I saw it, you know, it's like if, if you can tell an effective story online, you can capture an audience and you can, you can actually move people around pretty, pretty effectively. So it was just kind of in my mind that I, I, I was very impressed with the concept of social media and the internet. And so I, I was primarily making content around trying to raise money for this charity, so like military content. But at some point I began experimenting with, you know, personal branded content, like stuff that would just be for myself. And so much of it was like so cringy and terrible and didn't go anywhere <laughs> on any platform. I was like churning out these videos that were just so bad. I, I, I had this, this I, I pretended to be like a kid in elementary school that was like struggling on his math test and it like, oh. wasn't funny at all. But I had like a whole series behind it that like didn't get any traction. But eventually in uh, early 2020, I was at a, a water park in Pennsylvania, an indoor water park. Uh, with my wife and kids and I had been thinking about trying this new type of content, this strange, dark and mysterious uh, <laughs> storytelling type because I personally really liked strange, dark and mysterious content. I liked dark stories, like true, like true crime stuff. And I, I told this, I, t I made a quick TikTok in early 2020 about these missing hikers in Russia in the 1950s. It's the Dyatlov Pass mystery. Uh, to, to recap the story, these nine hikers in the 1950s that go into the Ural Mountains in, in Russia, and these are like incredibly talented hikers. They're not even hikers, they're like mountaineers. <laughs> and they, they were going out to do this test to basically prove that they were the, the top hikers in Russia. It's called your level three hiking test, which seems like nothing, but it was a big deal at the time. And, and they get lost, uh, or they, they don't get lost, they don't show up to their checkpoints. And so eventually the, the military is called in to go look for these, these nine hikers. And they ultimately find their campsite, and it's on the side of this mountain, this like windswept, you know, no trees, it's just like pure ice mountain. And their tent was, was cut open from the inside out, and like half their clothes were left inside the tent, folded neatly, and then there was all these footsteps leading away from the tent, where it, it was obvious that some people had like one shoe on, and some had no shoes on. It's the middle of the winter, it's like, you know, five feet of snow. Uh, and they, the, the, the military, they follow these tracks around and they find all the bodies of the hikers. They're all located, kind of strewn about the mountain and they're all deceased. But some of them were radioactive. Their skin was radioactive. You know, there's all these bizarre kind of tells on the body, you know, like they were missing pieces of their body. And the night before, the, the, the Soviet military was out there doing an exercise and they had reported seeing all these strange lights in the sky right over the Ural Mountains. And, and they had never made a report like that before. Like the military for the first time is reporting this particular thing and it lines up exactly with these hikers, you know, mysteriously dying. So I told that story in 60 seconds on TikTok, uh, thinking it was just going to flop like everything else I was doing. But I'm at this water park. I record this, this video about these hikers. I, I leave my phone in the room and I, I go to the water park because it's, it's going to get wet if I'm at the park with my phone. A couple hours later, I come back and, and my phone was like broken. There were so many notifications on my phone, I, I couldn't even open it. And then when I finally did, and I looked at that video, thinking it was gonna have like five views, it had five million views. And for reference, I've never ever to this point had any success on social media. It isn't like, <laughs> I know what I'm doing. It was like, what is this? Um, but candidly, it was like so fun, you know? Like, holy cow, like I, I did this thing that got all this attention. 
Uh, and my background is I, I was a Navy SEAL, and, and so I'm, I'm really good at doing like hard stuff for long periods of time. <laughs> and I like went into this mindset of like, I'm gonna make as many of these kind of videos as I possibly can and just see what happens. And it turns out there was a whole world that, that came out of this decision. You know, my, my TikTok account went from being this one-off story to becoming you know, a robust page with millions of followers that does storytelling content about strange, dark, and mysterious. Uh, I eventually you know, made it my job and transitioned to YouTube, which is a better monetization platform than TikTok, just because it's long form, it's easier to make money. Um, and then you know, when I was really seasoned with YouTube and we had millions of followers there, uh, it just seemed like I was basically already podcasting, but on YouTube. I was doing these like, 30 to 45 minute stories, much like the Dyatlov Pass. Um, and yeah, Nick here is, is my manager and also the CEO of our studio, Bowen Studios. And he and I decided that the next logical step would be to get into podcasting, primarily because for all of you who are here, this is probably why you're here. The opportunity is so big in podcasting right now. It's like stratospheric and people don't really know it unless you're in the industry. And so when we made the decision to go to podcasting, it was actually done with a, with a huge amount of intent. Everything else was kind of like, we'll see what happens, doing random stuff on TikTok and YouTube. But podcasting was like a strategic move because there's just an enormous amount of money, there's a huge audience to gain, and there's just so much opportunity that people don't even know about yet. It's like the beginning of this massive rush to podcasting where there's still opportunity to basically carve out massive, massive you know, footprint within this industry. So we went, we went to podcasting on purpose because of the opportunity, and here we are. So way rambly and, and long, but that's my It's answer. also hilarious. You have a former Navy SEAL, a former dancer, and someone who toured with One Direction. So really, <laughs> moral of the story, it's a very linear path. You have to go down that, that all points in time. <laughs> I guess you do everything about podcasting. Yeah, podcast. totally. <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, I see this one's for Kylie. How do you handle the sensitive nature of the content that's on your podcast? Like especially, you know, dealing with like the victims and the stories are pretty brutal. Absolutely. Yeah. The first thing I remind myself before getting into a case is that I am not entitled to that story. I'm not entitled to the story of the surviving family members, to what happened to the victim. And so while my goal ultimately is to work with a family member to tell the story of their loved one, to honor the legacy of the human at the center of each case, that's not always an option when creating a weekly show. So when I tell those stories, I keep in mind that if this ever were to reach a family member who I wasn't able to work with, will they feel honored? Will that legacy be honored? Um, and, you know, candidly, as an anxious person and a non-confrontational person, <laughs> I, would, I, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed and feel good about how I was, you know, transparently creating my livelihood through podcasting, through telling these stories, knowing that it could potentially dredge up some trauma and cause harm. So my first point of attack is knowing that I'm not entitled to this story and I'm going to do right by it, by, do right by the family, even if I can't work with them directly. Mm. I love that. Awesome, awesome. Johnny, I know you've you know, been through this a lot, through the stories you tell, whether it's strange or mysterious or true crime, you kind of want to go into your, your vision and how you deal with that stuff? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I've said this a couple times online, uh, but it's not lost on, on myself or anybody else at Ballin Studios that fundamentally in, in being in the business of true crime, like literally the, the name of the discussion here, we are profiting off of other people's tragedies. Like that is what it is. There's no two ways about it. And if you try to tell it like it's something else, you're just, you're lying to yourself. But it's not wrong as long as you are honoring the people in that story. And, and also, I would say from our perspective, going into the business of true crime, we really felt strongly that we wanted to literally give back a portion of the profits we were making on these tragedies to the people in these stories. And so fairly early on, uh, kind of before we even knew if the whole Mr. Ballin thing would really take, take hold, we set up a, a charity and, and really put a lot of energy into building out the Mr. Ballin Foundation. Uh, we recruited this incredible executive director and, and Lori Gift is her name, who's been doing this for 20 years. I mean, we built a robust foundation um, right out the gate. And we also committed an enormous amount of money from our studio to ensure all donations going into the charity 
would, would go 100% out the door to victims and their families. So there's, there's, a, there's a big push on our end to like literally give back, but then also just certainly to your point, being very, very cognizant of the fact that these are real people, real tragedies, and you really need to honor the people that are in these stories. And then lastly, uh, this is more of a stylistic point, but I have always found that, at least for, for the shows that I'm hosting, it's, it's very effective when you're telling a story about true crime, let's say, to put the audience in the perspective of the victim, uh, only because a lot of times when you're, when you're viewing other true crime shows in, in any medium, a lot of times the emphasis is placed on the killer or the kind of the atrocity that was committed. And, and of course that needs to be a part of the story to some degree, but it's, it's frankly, just purely from a content perspective, it's what we're all so accustomed to. When in reality, if you really want to grip your audience with a true crime story, if you put them in the mind of the victim, it's much more relatable and frankly, you will, you will appreciate what actually happened to these people because it's like, wait a minute, this person is just like me. This horrible thing that happened to them could have happened to me, to my neighbor, to my friend. Um, but it also allows you not only to put them in that perspective, but as the narrator, you can really build out the victim and you can actually honor their life, literally. You can tell people who these people were, what they were doing, what mattered to them, who their family was, who their friends were. I mean, we have families reaching out to us afterwards that say what a difference it made to have the story told the way you told it. You know, Dateline covered it, this, this, the, they covered it, whoever covered it, and it was totally exploitative, but the way you did it was with was, was class. And so that's, that's our guiding star for sure. Uh, how much has uh, the the foundation been donated to? Like how much has the studio or how much have you donated to the foundation today? Since we launched the Mr. Ballin Foundation about two years ago, it's donated, I think, a, a little over a million dollars to, to victims and their families of, of true crime. So. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm this one goes to kind of the business and to the, uh, the, the host of the storyteller. So um, what's been the most difficult thing in podcasting that each of you have kind of gone through or what was like your initial first big hurdle or what's something that you can look back on that kind of was a real tough moment once you either started or once you were starting and you were successful and kind of hit some roadblocks? I, I think it comes back to content for us. Um, I think in podcasting, you're always gonna figure out technically, you can Google how to make your content or like your, uh, from a technical perspective, your production experience better, right? Every blog will tell you what best mic, how to treat your walls, how to publish your things. Nobody's gonna tell you how to look, you know, a victim's loved one in the eye and talk about why you do what you do. And so I say the privilege of my role is I've had a lot of conversations with different individuals who podcasting is such a new medium, right? And we view it, it's becoming an extension of investigative journalism. We're seeing our, you know, our content, we've been very fortunate. Uh, Audio Check has been a part of identifying 11 Jane and John Doe's. We have 12 solves right now when it comes to different murders uh, throughout the country. And so being able to tell people like, no, 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 this isn't frivolous. Like this really is intentional. Here's what we do without coming off as anything defensive, because to your point, like the entitlement is something that is really grody in the space, right? Um, those conversations, no one teaches you to be a good person. Um, so that I think has been the biggest challenge of how to approach those sensitive conversations. So quick follow up. So you guys have discovered stories that didn't have an ending and you guys kind of closed the case. Yeah, and actually recently what's been, I mean, you know, a dream come true in the sense of like, oh my God, this is all worth it. Uh, there was a case out in Odessa, Texas, uh, Father Patrick Ryan, years and years and years ago. And the man who was convicted for it was since released, but was on parole. And it was very clear the man didn't do it. Um, a lot of, go back and listen to the episode, I won't give you all the good stuff, but uh, we published an episode on his case. The daughter and son-in-law of the Odessa chief of police listened to the episode. They were driving en route to Odessa. They're like, hey dad, what the, like you gotta check out this case. He actually listened to them. It led to them taking a look at the case file again and they found evidence that had not been tested. The man has since been exonerated. Um, and so we're very fortunate that the Innocence Project of Texas reached out to us. Obviously they are you know, doing uh, just the most incredible work out there and have 
been uh, humble enough and gracious enough to give us partial credit for being able to be a part of that. And so it's all worth it. <laughs> yeah. As far as you, you were speaking about the challenges in creating this content, uh, I think for me, being an independent creator at the beginning, there was a lot of imposter syndrome that came along with launching a show and claiming the title of investigative journalist. Even though I had that degree, I still couldn't believe it about myself until I was actually in the act and actually investigating these stories and reporting on these stories. Um, but the other part of that challenge, and it really was all mindset based, I think at the beginning was launching a show that was regionally focused. I think new creators, new podcasters getting into this space, there's certainly the dazzle of the potential financial upside of starting a show. And if I had launched my show as a side hustle at the time, knowing or defining success only as how much money I could make with it, I would have stopped very early on. The show truly was a passion project. I believed in the mission of honoring the legacy of the humans at the center of each case and working with family members and bringing attention to longstanding unsolved homicides and missing persons cases. And so that was my definition of success. And luckily there were other people, there were audience members who believed in that definition of success as well and they believed in the show. And that's why a regional show, while you might think may only bring a regional audience, ended up having a much wider appeal. Because people didn't really care at the end of the day where the stories were being told. They wanted to hear the stories and they wanted to feel good about the content they were listening to. Mm. And so seeing that really click for my audience, seeing that growth at the beginning, certainly having the support of a hometown audience coming from local radio, people recognized my voice and they really supported that hometown girl telling hometown stories at the beginning. But then it just spread because word of mouth, people liked the show, they got what I was doing and they wanted to support it. So the challenges I think at the beginning for me being an independent creator was the, the mindset of it all. Um, and, and defining a version of success that would keep me motivated even when I didn't have sponsors. My very first sponsor, by the way, <laughs> was a local woman-owned business. And so I always tell, I, I work with women who wanna you know, launch podcasts, I'm like, reach out to the people in your community, see what you can do to you know, fund your show, at least keep the lights on, pay your hosting bill at the start. You, know, you don't need <laughs> big sponsors at the beginning to really keep your show going. I hope everyone wrote that last point down on their notebook, because that's, that's a good point when it comes to the financing of the, of the show and, and how you can keep it on, like you need people to give you money, whether it's brands or partners or anything like that. So in case, some, in case anyone missed it, plug your show one more time. <laughs> My show? It's Dark, dark Down East, uh, New England's true crime podcast. There you go. Well, same one for you, Johnny. What was like the toughest oh. thing that you came across when you started podcasting? You know, maybe an early hurdle or a late hurdle. I mean, admittedly, uh, when we first decided to launch the podcast, which was early 22. Yeah, February of 2022. So the, the Mr. Ballin podcast, our flagship show, we launched that in February of 2022. Um, but the few months leading up to it, that was when we made the decision that we're gonna, we're gonna do this whole podcasting thing, you know, the whole strategic move into podcasting. Uh, but we had no idea how to make a podcast. Uh, we, like, I'm not kidding. We had to Google, like, what is an RSS feed and how do you get one? Um, uh, I still can't even fully explain what an no RSS really feed is. <laughs> no, there's people for that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but truthfully, the, the, the thing with podcasting, and I think this probably extends to any kind of new Burgoyning media, is you know like there's so much going on that it's really hard to identify like what path you should take if you're just starting. Um, you know it's like there's a million podcast platforms which if you are not in the business it's not clear like well wait do I have to literally post on every single podcast <laughs> platform? Do I do I choose a few? Like there it's just it's an overwhelming amount of opportunity or options that you can take in in the in the industry. And trying to figure out what we should do was really a challenge. And frankly, at the time when we were trying to get into podcasting, you know, we had pretty influential friends in podcasting that we could turn to to ask questions about like, how do you build a podcast? Like, what are the most important things? Like, you know, on YouTube, for example, um, at scale, when you're doing videos, you know, every single week or whatever, or whatever your, if your cadence is constant, 
you know, your title of your video and your thumbnail image are critical to the success of that video. Like, unfortunately, it's not the case that if you just have a really good video, it's gonna mm -hmm. go really far. It probably won't. You, it, it has every, everything to do with the algorithm. Um, and it should be quality video. You should make a good video. Uh, but podcasting, it's like we didn't know what are the things you should focus on. And so what we learned is uh, consistency is probably the most important thing when you start a podcast. You, you have to start by identifying, or you have to start by letting your audience know what your posting schedule is going to be, and then you can't mess it up. As soon as you mess it up, there's just too many podcasts, probably in your genre, that are posting more frequently and posting better content that you can't afford to miss that. So it's like identify how often you're gonna post and commit to it. And if you're just getting into podcasting, you need to understand too that you're also beginning something that will make you basically no money to begin with. Unless you have some other really compelling way to make money with podcasting, like you've got some other big audience elsewhere, fine. But if you're just getting into podcasting, it's a slog up front. It's like long form content on repeat probably every week. And also, by the way, weekly shows are like, <laughs> that's, that is the thing that, that are coveted by advertisers. You want to have a weekly always on show. The seasonal run or the, the limited series runs, the six episode, eight episode, 10 episode runoffs, they might win crazy awards and be super successful and everybody, everybody might love them, but advertisers don't. They're not going to advertise on that, at least not even close to what you get on a weekly always on show. So I'm kind of going off the rails here, but basically it is an overwhelming landscape to look at if you're just starting um, and so trying to distill what to do was quite a challenge and then and then literally i remember the day before we went live we were like practicicing uploading podcasts because we didn't even know how to do it like all right i'm gonna put it on now like do you see it on on apple like um so but it's, it's very doable uh you just need to like understand that it's it looks like chaos but if you actually just pick your pick your posting cadence Stick, stick to the cadence, learn what an RSS feed is, you know, <laughs> and just stick to it. Like honestly, with podcasting, volume and consistency actually go a pretty far away. Um, until, they, in, until they adopt a really aggressive algorithm that kind of goes across every platform, like you do have the opportunity to just kind of like mass produce content. And if it catches, if one thing catches, you have this whole back catalog of content that those people are gonna wanna uh, consume. So uh, it's, last thing is, on social media, TikTok right now is like the one platform where you can totally get organic reach, meaning you can get on there with no following and, and make it big on TikTok. I'd say it's less so than it was in like 2020 and 2021, but from a podcasting perspective, you should be thinking hard about uh, syncing up with a TikTok account as you grow your podcast, because just posting clips of your podcast, even if it's a static image on TikTok with just your audio playing, there's so much opportunity for organic growth on TikTok and then also Instagram Reels where you can just download videos from TikTok, dump on Instagram Reels. You can also spike your podcast growth just by making sure you're posting on those, those platforms. So make sure you don't miss on the organic growth opportunity on TikTok and Reels uh, and be really consistent with podcasting. So, I want to touch on the uh, consistency bit because one of the first things Ashley Flowers said to me when I remember when I thought I was getting catfished um, <laughs> when she reached out or when Kevin reached out the first thing she said in our meeting was you never miss a Monday I, mm -hmm. my Monday was my release schedule at the time and I don't know if I hadn't maintained that consistency and kept that promise to my listeners to my audience that I was going to release a weekly show every Monday without fail I don't know if I would have had the opportunity to join the network because that's what made me stand out so yeah definitely doubling Perhaps. up on that consistency <laughs> point <laughs> That's great advice. Yeah, Johnny, you were going into you know the, the art of discoverability, right? With with TikTok, uh, and that's a great point, Kylie. And the funny thing, you know, when John brought up, you know, we knew nothing about podcasting. I mean, we knew nothing. So I called up anyone that I knew that knew anything about podcasting, which is pretty much everybody, and asked a million questions and asked each one of them if they knew someone who knew more about podcasting than them. And then we probably had about a hundred calls and figured out how we'd do it, and kind of the rest is history. Yeah. But um, all right, so here's a question kind of both of you guys combined because it's sort of business, sort of host. Um, how do you engage with your audience and what role does the listener and their interactions play in your podcast? Oh, can I start? Yeah, yeah, start. Oh. Okay. So obviously, this uh, crime junkie is our tent pole, if you will. And I think at one point in time, producers of true crime under underestimated what the listener and what the viewer was willing to do after the episode ended. 
And I think where Crime Junkie has succeeded was the list, it's a three-way conversation with the you know 50 million people that listen a month. And what we've seen, the first role at AudioChuck that was ever hired was a fan engagement person to sit and answer every email, every message, send a letter back, anything. And I think that deep connection with your listener, especially in our space, because I think if, if you're creating true crime content in a vacuum, you're already kind of off. Um, if you're doing it with the intention of saying, hey you, I want you to listen and then get up and go do something about it, right? That means you have to feel like I'm someone that's worth getting up and walking and going doing something for, right? And so where Britt and Ashley have been so amazing is not only is their friendship true, right? Like they do have this incredible story. They are so deeply passionate about it. And then the listener by doing, it's this funnel, right? Like the more the listener gives, the more we can give back. And so they know, they've seen what can happen when they show up, which is why we have, I think, the little revolution of crime junkies that we do. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> no, the fan engagement team at Audio Chuck is incredible, and that was one of the many perks that Dark Down East gets to benefit from, you know, as joining the network. Um, but they're always there commenting, engaging with fans, making sure if someone has a case recommendation, it's landing in the right place. And that was something as an independent creator that, you know, kind of fell by the wayside. I was, I was doing everything from start to finish. And so engaging with fans was something that was really challenging for me. And now having this support of Audio Chuck to make sure that one, yeah, right, they're taking action, that they know how to take action, that at the end of every episode, there is a call to action, whether it's, you know, just a, if it's a tip line or if it's an opportunity to support a cause that's important to the family or that would help, uh, you know, support the solve of the case. And so the fan, the listener is very much a part of the ecosystem of the show. It certainly couldn't exist without somebody listening, but we do expect them to do something about it when they're done listening. It's not just entertainment at the end of it. All right, over to me. Um, so I, I think I'm in a little bit of a unique position with, with, with regards to audience engagement, uh, only because uh, I'm, I'm one of the, uh, I am a podcaster that really started more as a, as a YouTuber and digital content creator first. Um, whereas I, I think that there are quite a few very significant podcasters and podcast organizations that are just podcast. They don't really have necessarily an equally robust social media and other side following. Um, but so because we went the other direction, starting with social media and YouTube and that kind of thing, and, and then transitioned to podcasting, um, we have the benefit of, frankly, the comment section in, in YouTube. We have comment sections across Instagram. Um, there's, there's just, there's, there's, uh, the platforms all literally allow you to actually interact with fans, whereas with podcasting, find me a comment section for podcasting. They, they don't really exist. I mean, maybe you could, you could say Reddit kind of turns into the comment <laughs> section, but Reddit also turns into like hell in, being in, in Reddit. Um, but, uh, but as a result, you know, the, the way in which the Mr. Ball and brand really grew is, you know, early on when I uh, first kind of went viral on TikTok and then was posting on YouTube, Against my better judgment and against lots of recommendations, I was reading comments and reading, you know, what people were saying, um, and obviously fixating on only the negative stuff. Uh, but I, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I uh, screwed me up for a while. Um, but I found that, uh, you know, looking looking through the comments, you can actually find a lot of pretty meaningful feedback that actually is useful. Uh, you know, people that do mean well. They might be criticizing you, but they do have things that are pretty valuable to say. And I kind of like inadvertently conditioned myself to, to seek out those types of comments, but, but look at them genuinely as a positive thing. Because like these are people that are actually trying to make what you do more successful because it's good for them. Um, and so I am a compulsive comment reader and comment responder, like across the internet. We actually, um, le letting the cat out of the bag a little bit here, but we, we have a, a fan engagement team, if you will. Uh, so I'm personally interacting with fans all the time, and we also have other people that pretend to be me that interact with fans, but don't tell anybody. Um, and uh, so, but there's, there's an enormous amount of, of just back and forth because we had that social side built up, the digital side. 
Uh, and so when we went into podcasting, we very quickly learned like it's very hard to get that real time feedback from fans. And so we have relied disproportionately on our social media and YouTube to basically interact with our fans who are on the podcast. But that just, I would say, that just goes to show how, frankly, young podcasting is, that that has not been solved yet on the platform level. Like, there should be a comment section for podcasting. There should be some level of engagement with the fans, but it doesn't exist yet. That's a good sign. It <laughs> means that it's still really early, and it's a great time to get into podcasting in a really serious way. So we are very intentional on the social media uh, and on the kind of digital side to stay engaged with our audience. Very good, everyone. Uh, I was told I need to answer one question, so I'll read this one in. Can we read it to you? Yeah, well, Which one is it? Yeah. Me with uh, the first one up top. All right, here we go. <laughs> Looking ahead, what do you see as the future of true crime podcasting, and how do you plan to evolve your content to meet changing audience demands and trends? And then I'm going to combine this with, what about the future of podcasting overall and your involvement in it? All right, you got 60 seconds. <laughs> this one. So it's interesting because like what Johnny is saying, you know, Kylie and Brittany are saying is it's a saturated market. There's always new shows coming out. If you look at the charts of Spotify, Apple, they're always changing. The top 10 is rarely the same. Maybe there's five that stay on the top 10 and five that stay in the top 20. The rest just pop up and down. Um, you need to be innovative. Uh, I know what Audio Truck has done, and I won't speak for them, but like building a network of other shows that are within their umbrella. So for us, you know, it's Strange, Dark, Mysterious, so it's everything from true crime to um, unexplained deaths, to paranormal, to UFO, etc. And we started signing uh, creators in YouTube that want to get into podcasting and building a funnel for them. And then just always kind of paying attention to what's going on. So, you know, your content should be evolving but you should stay true to what you're doing as a creator. Like I know John, in the very beginning when we started the show, you know, everyone had their two cents. It should be like this, it should be like that, mm -hmm. it should be house it should be. And I just go, Johnny, just make sure you do it how you want to do it and it's going to be just fine. And you know, so stay true to yourself and to your brand, uh, but also don't be afraid to innovate, right? There's the whole like, oh yeah, it's got to be 35 to 40 minutes, it's got to da da da. You know, now it's, you know, Spotify's focusing on simulcast, which is video and audio, right? So all these things are kind of changing and you gotta stay, you know, ahead of the, uh, the curve on that. But I think, you know, realistically, if you have a flagship show, like what you guys have and we have, you know, being able to use that and grow it into other shows, whether it's John doing it, or we're incubating other creators and other hosts to create their own shows, um, you always have to just be paying attention and. You know, what you did maybe a year or two ago might not be the thing you should be doing next year. So, And also, I just want to add one kind of level. This is like a tactical piece of information that I think is true. It might not be, but I think it is. <laughs> um, so, you know, so we are at a very high level in podcasting. We're one of the premier shows in true crime. So you could make the case that we, we are at the top of the industry. And I will tell you that from my purview, the most important thing about a show, especially a new show, is where it stands in the rankings. I don't care what people say about it, that is like a big piece of clout and it matters. Um, and so if you're thinking about goals for a show, getting onto any ranking, like it doesn't even matter what ranking it is. If you just land on some chart, like a top 200 somewhere, that is actual currency in the podcasting world to showcase the strength of your show. And it doesn't, it doesn't really matter if your show drops from that position, it needs to hit it at some point and you hold on to that number, and you can use that when you're talking to people about your show. I do that right now with our shows. That does matter currently at, at what I would say is like the top. That's what people care about. There's loads of other factors as well, but in terms of setting goals for a show, it's not petty and it, it, it's not meaningless to be in a ranking somewhere. So in terms of going ahead, that's a great goal to get on a chart somewhere because it, it holds currency. How many shows does uh, the network have on like the Amazon top 50? Well, now we're just 100% flexing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we have a few, but no, nothing compared to Audio Truck. You guys have like 75 shows in Apple Top 10. Yeah, so. All right, um, Brittany and, and Kylie. Yeah, what's so interesting about this question to me is over the past like five years, <laughs> if you would have said what you would have done a year ago, you're not doing that now. And I think that we constantly, it's the joy and the pitfall of being in an industry that is so young, 
what we are trying to do is be adaptable, but also not compromise. And I think uh, out of desperation, you'll see a lot of content compromise what they do to fit what advertisers are asking them to do. And it's a lot of work to figure out how to make it work for your content, right? Um, we, uh, you'll get shiny new toy syndrome, right? Like, so uh, someone will come to you and be like, oh my God, we're doing this cool new thing. You have to be the first ones to do it. And we're like, oh, tell us more. And you start to like really get to the nitty gritty and you're like, I think this could be a great thing or not so great. And I'm not willing to be the one to find out <laughs> because it's so much bigger than that, right? Especially when you've dedicated how many years to developing your product. Stick with what you know to be true. The rest will follow. Um, and I think that as new content is coming out, as you're reading the trade publications, as you're seeing that, keep your ear to the ground. You want to know where people are succeeding and where they're failing. Um, and you don't want it to entirely dictate every decision you're making, but you do want it to inform. Um, and so I do struggle with the future question because I think we'll be sitting here a year from now being like, whatever I said last year, throw it out the window. <laughs> like, you know, iOS 17, big conversation right now within the space of how that's affecting downloads. Yeah. We wouldn't have ever thought that would be part of our conversation necessarily a year ago. So it's sticking true to what you do, staying informed and not compromising, in my opinion. I love it when she talks. <laughs> She's really good at talking. <laughs> um, I think in speaking to the maybe this, the future of true crime specifically, yeah. I, I think the industry is on the verge of a empathy reckoning, or we're standing in it right now, and it's driven by the surviving family members realizing that they do deserve a voice in this, and it's been the you know the ones with the courage to stand up and um, you know and take that voice for themselves and make their voice heard. You know, mm -hmm. a friend of the network, certainly Sarah Turney, I love mm -hmm. what she's doing with media pressure, with Julie Murray telling Maura Murray's story. That's a case from New England that my listeners have asked me to cover. And, you know, quite frankly, it scared me because there were so many voices on that story. What could I add? And Julie's voice is the one that should have been adding to that story. So it's really cool to see that this industry is evolving and being, you know, sitting on this stage, a bunch of creators who have that victim focus, who are also advocacy driven, who are raising money and contributing money to the causes that are most important to the families at the center of all of this. I think that's where the industry has started to go, true crime specifically, and it will continue to go that way. And there's, you know, there's no fighting it. There's no room for the entitlement anymore in this space. It's really, it's going to be the voices of the victims that get louder and louder. Mm -hmm. um, very good, very good. Uh, one cool question. Do we want to open up for general Q&A? We have eight minutes left. Sure. Let's do it. Okay, cool. <laughs> Round of applause for you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Guys. Thank you. You too. <laughs> yeah, you too, man. Well done, Nick. Good job. All right, any questions? Raise those hands high. We got one in the back on the left. Oh, I'm having a blast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I say even on the hard days, it's so worth it. Um, podcasting is freaking hard. And the barrier to entry is so low that you kind of go into it like, do, 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 like thinking it's going to be one thing. And then you start to do it and you're like, well, if no one's listening to it, is this any fun? Like it starts to become this like, you know, screaming into a void. It is so, the hard days are really stinking hard, as is every job, you know, probably in the world. I feel like the luckiest chick on the planet to get to do what I do every day. Yeah, ditto. I'm, I'm still having fun. You know, it's a very special brand of fun when your passion and a purpose combines into something that contributes to your personal growth, but that's, you know, helping people at the same time. It's a really special cocktail. And, you yeah. know, to, to launch with Audio Chuck January 4th to see my show, sitting at the top of the charts when I literally started this in my closet in Maine during the pandemic. I still record in my closet, but it, it, that's, what it, <laughs> that's all it takes. You know, you can sit at the top of the charts. So I'm, I'm absolutely having fun while also knowing that this is a very uh, heavy responsibility mm -hmm. to carry telling these stories. Uh, so uh, Monday through, well, honestly, most seven days a week usually, but Monday through Friday, I, I go into my studio at like, you know, 8.30 in the morning, and every day, 
I think the same thing. <laughs> Today is going to be the day that I have a flawless, easy <laughs> recording. <laughs> But then I start the recording and the first 20 minutes are literally without fail for like three years, just me screwing up a line and swearing repeatedly as loud as I can until finally I have to leave the room and calm myself down. And then my warm up's done and I go back in and sometimes I'm able to do a recording at that point. Okay. So jokes aside, it's like every day is such a, it's, a, it's so different day to day, like how it's going to go. But consistently, it's just going to be harder than you think it is. Uh, trying to create long form content on a weekly cadence. You know, we have several shows we create every single week. Like the words, we, we, we got to get ahead are like the worst things I hear like all day long. It's like, I know we need What's to get ahead. What's your backlog? Ahead. I know we need to get ahead. You got the Kaylee's favorite word. Uh, no, but it's, it's, it's an incredible, incredible opportunity to, to be able to be, you know, pioneering at least to some degree. Uh, in this industry, and as challenging as it is, uh, every day I, I I feel very thankful to be doing this. And then also just to, my my background being in the military, which was like a <laughs> lot of hard work. You know, it makes this feel so relaxed to just hang out in my studio and like tell stories. So, uh, yeah, so it's it's good. It, it, it's a, it's a grind, but it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, what what creators have to go through and the pressure of just having to put up a weekly show is just insane. I guess a manager with clients and obviously managing him and I'm sure with you guys and your creators that you guys have under your shows. I mean, the pressure's immense, right? Especially when it starts to be successful. You think, man, if I get sick, if I get into a car wreck, if I get COVID, if my fucking power's out, <laughs> there's a million things that could go wrong on a weekly show. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I would say it's, it's definitely a good time. Uh, great question. Good time to play one more. Yeah, great question. Yeah, who, uh, who else? Uh, one more in the back left again. Back left is hitting hard. <laughs> How much time do you have? Yeah. Pick one, no pressure. I'll start. So I sat down with Judy Richardson, who is the mother of Darian Richardson. I can't tell the story without getting. Uh -huh. um, Darian was spending the night at her boyfriend's house when she was shot in her bed during a home invasion. She was not the intended target. She survived, um, but about six weeks later, complications with a bullet still lodged in her hip ultimately ended her life. And Judy, you know, this case is still unsolved. Judy and her husband have been very vocal um, about getting more attention on the case and trying to change some background check laws in Maine for firearms. And so they're, they're very vocal people, but they never felt like their story was told end to end. And I got to sit down across the table to Judy in a house where Darian's picture is still on all the walls. Mm -hmm. And she was showing me artwork that Darian made as a child. And I'm a mother now, and I just can't imagine living through that. And so Darian's case, Darian's face, it comes back to me with every story I'm telling. These are the darkest moments of someone's life and they're opening up to me and trusting me with that. And that's not something I can take lightly. So Darian stays with me, Judy stays with me. I work with Judy all the time. She started a foundation. I help her, you know, do the web design on Squarespace that I'm, <laughs> I'm not very good at, but like I'm trying to do whatever I can to help. And so. Darian Richardson, um, I've covered her story on Dark Down East, but uh, that's one that stays with me. Mm. If you're an Audio Check fan, you'll definitely uh, know this one. Darlene Hulse in Argus, Indiana. So The Deck Investigates was a new series that we launched uh, last year. Yeah, it's not and we actually took though. the case on tour. And we did an 11 city tour around the country telling the story. Highly recommend listening to season one, but it's one that we've had to put a lot of pressure on local authorities who are just kind of sitting on their hands, unfortunately. And the loved ones have gotten very close to us and the team. And that story is so solvable that it haunts me at night of just what could be done. And we have a nonprofit, Ashley founded Season of Justice, which focuses on granting funds for genealogy testing. And that could be utilized in two seconds if the powers that be. And so I get very angry. Um, but I believe that we are on the path to hopefully a solve in the very near future. 
Um, so we, uh, on the Mr. Ballin podcast anyways, uh, like I, th I think without fail, have only covered solved uh, uh, true crime stories or solved mysteries. Uh, and that's largely because stylistically the way we cover stories is there's always like a wrap up at the end where all things that were missing have been you know, filled in and now the audience understands and knows the story. So I don't have a good unsolved. I will say though, to tie in to the first thing I said about the, the missing hikers in the 1950s, granted it, it has been solved, it has been solved. I don't know if I'd buy it, but the, the Russian <laughs> government, they, they actually recently re-examined the Dyatlov Pass uh, and they determined that all, you know, the, all the things they saw were, were explained by a slab of ice had slipped and, and hit them in their tent. And I guess that apparently made them radioactive and made them flee their tent and run into the forest and die across a mile of space. But um, so I'd say the Dyatlov Pass one I still consider unsolved, and that would be the one. Awesome! Thank you guys. Thanks all the That's time. That's it. We have Thank, you. Thank you all for coming.